everyone. I'm so happy that you're joining us for the latest video cast Bespoke Conversations here at Skylark International. I'm Nikki Sims and I'll be your host as together we throw some light on some of the key issues affecting women both closer to home and across the world. We'll be hearing the inside track from some incredible women who are changing the story for others in their day-to-day -day lives. I'm joined today by Rachel David, Director of World of Worth, a charity passionate about restoring dignity, hope and worth to women and girls around the world. World of Worth supports hundreds of women every month across six countries who've been marginalised, widowed or abandoned and provides opportunities for them to transform their world through education, counselling, training and micro businesses. Rachel herself is a qualified nutritional therapist and Pilates instructor, and she'll also be sharing more with us about her personal journey. Please be aware, this conversation will touch on some challenging areas of emotional and mental health, as well as suicide and abuse. It's going to be a powerful conversation. So are you ready to be inspired, informed and invested? Let's see what Rachel has to share with us. Rachel, welcome to Bespoke Conversations. Thank you. I am so excited for this conversation. I feel certain that your story is going to resonate with so many of the women listening in. So I'm looking forward to unpacking more with you. But I want to start with a day in the life of Rachel David. <laughs> Are you a morning person? I am. I'm one of those really annoying morning people, oh, actually. No. Yes, yes. Okay, I'm getting the picture. <laughs> so do you have a morning routine and can you talk us through it? I do. I like to get up early and seize the day. Um, and then I usually walk my dog or go for a swim, do some exercise before breakfast. Then I get home. And, wow. Uh, yeah, and then I have the same breakfast every day, which I love. And I always say to my husband, I love my breakfast. <laughs> what is it? So it's usually some seasonal fruit chopped up with uh, some Greek yogurt and some healthy cedar granola. And I just sit and munch Ooh, my way through it and love that it. That does sound good. That sounds yeah. amazing. So I know that you're passionate about a lot of things, mm -hmm. but aside from the charity World of Worth that you are director for, what sparks joy in you? I think being outside in the countryside, I always mm. just lift my spirits. I feel joyful, happy. I love seeing my dog lolloping along by the side of me until she rolls in something nasty, which <laughs> could change the dynamics of Not the walk. Not so great. But on the whole, that that's what I, I love doing. It fills me with joy. And do you have any pet peeves? I do. I really hate bad customer service. Ooh, so I yes. hate being ignored or when they're particularly rude it just really annoys me that crosses a core value for you okay that's really interesting now thinking about your life I know that you have worn many different hats throughout your life to date um, as so many of us women do you are director of an incredible charity world of worth and we'll come on to that in due course you're a mum you're a wife friend to many you have been a career woman so many different parts to your story but I'd like to take us back to the beginning and your formative years what was your childhood like and how did it affect you in adult life so my early childhood was really happy, had two very wonderful parents and quite an idyllic childhood. Mm. So that was growing up early on. But sadly, when I was 12, my mum became ill with a brain tumour. And that really changed things because for many years she was seriously ill, either having surgery or in recovery. And I just had to get on with life um, without my mum around, really. So that was quite a shock to the system after having an idyllic start. Uh, then when my mum recovered, uh, mum and dad were always people that wanted to help others. So all through my childhood, early on, they'd always had people in their home caring for them and, and doing lovely things for people. But when I was a teenager, later on, they decided to open up their home to drug addicts. Wow. So this was actually in my house. Goodness. So I went really from being quite this idyllic childhood, my mum's brain tumour, to then having people with serious issues coming into my home and sometimes they would spit in my meals and it was quite an unsafe environment so I left home quite early on mm. so those things definitely have an impact on later life yeah it's certainly my mum and dad exemplified how to love other people and show care and want to change people people's lives for the better yeah but on the other hand, it made it made me strong and resilient. It also had certain impacts on, on my own self-care and well-being. 
Yeah, and I'd love to come on to that, actually, because I know that self-care is something that we as women know that we need to prioritise and yet find so, so hard to do. Your childhood experiences, I'm sure, have contributed to what I see in you, which is someone who is beautifully helpful, very perceptive, really giving. Um, you you know, you see a need and you're the kind of person that instantly is going to think I could do something about that, which I, I know those qualities are some of your superpowers. <laughs> but I'm sure also that there must be a flip side to that, which many of us women would be able to identify with, that sometimes we find it hard to say no, to put boundaries in place and to really exercise that self-care. Has that been your story? How do you exercise self-care and has it been a struggle for you at times? Yes, is the, is the short answer to that. It mm. absolutely has been a struggle for me. Like, like I say, my mum and dad modelled how to give to others. Um, any self-care was not... Uh, said but perceived as being selfish I guess it was always give to others before yourself right. was the message that I was receiving and it is a wonderful thing to do to give to others but not at the expense of your own self-care no. and so a big part of my journey was learning to take care of myself because I ignored all my own needs and I think like you say as women we're very good at ignoring our own needs we are and giving to others instead that is so true. So what would some of your top tips be for women listening in today when it comes to self-care? What have you learned along the way? I have learned that if you don't take care of yourself, it is really to your own detriment. And health-wise, mental and emotional well-being-wise, you won't actually be able to live life to the full if you're not taking care of yourself because something will give. And part of my story, which I'll be sharing, is how that happened to me. Yeah. So my top tips are to think about yourself and to to not ignore warning signs that could potentially show that you are not taking good care of yourself. Wow. What do you think are some of the things that hold us back? I think that there's a, a whole guilt that we might feel when Definitely. we take care of ourselves first. There's always something else to do. There's always the, the washing up to be done or a job to be done or someone to take somewhere or somebody demanding our attention maybe. And we can get so super busy that it's very easy to feel guilty if we decide to take a bath in the midst of all this busyness and just take that time out yeah. so I think guilt might take a part just lack of self-awareness of maybe how we're feeling and and just not taking time because we are too busy to looking looking after other people that's so true we talk a lot as women about multitasking and we're brilliant at that but I think that we can all relate to the constant juggle. Mm. There's this pressure on us as women to have it all, to do it all, to be all things to all people. And we often feel that we're spinning all the plates, don't we? I know that this is part of your story massively and that there was a time in your life when your daughter was young, you had a, a, a great career and you felt that you were keeping all of these plates mm. um, spinning in the air. Can you describe that juggle and that, that time? for us so it was a time where I had had a car accident quite a few years before and I was in constant pain the, the pain radiated into terrible headaches the doctors thought they were migraines but I was trying to do life with a lot of pain gosh and that is really difficult start yeah so my daughter was young my husband worked away he had a career I was working as well and my dad then became ill and was in hospital about 30 miles away so on, after finishing work and doing everything else, I was driving down to see him. We were also undertaking a massive DIY project in our house to the point where we had tarpaulin for walls and the, the only thing I could cook in was a microwave on the floor. It was just a okay, disaster. So you weren't doing things by halves No, then. not at all. That, you know, <laughs> never do things by halves. So I was spinning all of these plates, but it was starting to feel out of control for me. Mm. And the, the plates were teetering on the edge of falling but yeah. because I, I was strong and resilient, or so I thought, in my head, I'd always been fiercely independent following yeah. my childhood, I just felt I had to keep them all going. And the other thing was, is that people always said to me, I don't know how you do it, and you're so so amazing. And it does go to your head a bit, and pride always comes before a fall. Yes. And so I felt even more pressure, the pressure on me to actually keep juggling all these plates and keep them spinning, was just getting a bit insane. So what were the early warning signs for you that your well-being and your mental health were beginning to plummet? So constant headaches every single day, 
popping painkillers, strong painkillers for years to mask the pain. So that was one thing. Mm. And I I learned a big lesson that you can't cheat your body. Don't ignore it. The other thing was I started suffering with irritable bowel syndrome and digestive problems. And that was really bad because that led to panic attacks around eating and and all sorts of issues there. Mm. So I was ignoring health issues. I was also ignoring my mental and emotional well-being because I felt really tearful a lot of the time and I in fact I would cry when I felt like I couldn't cope but all this was going on under the surface Mm. whilst I was putting on a really brave face to my husband I didn't want to let him down because he had this career I didn't want to let my daughter down didn't want to let my work down so I felt the heap of responsibility and it just felt overwhelming. That feeling of overwhelm, I'm sure many of us can relate to that, that those times where you feel that pressure not to let anybody down, mm. to keep everything in the air, yeah. to produce results and outcomes, to make sure that everybody else is fine. Yeah. But inside, you really weren't fine, were you? Not at all. And no. a moment came where you would say you hit rock bottom, you, mm. you had a breakdown. Yes. What was that dark and difficult time in your life like? It Dark and difficult just describes it because it felt like I was in this terrible, terrible place and I had no idea how to get out of it. So the, the way it happened was one night I woke up in the middle of the night having a panic attack. Now, I didn't know at the time it was a panic attack. I'd never heard of panic attacks. I'd been suffering with it like a churning stomach and mm. heart palpitations and this low grade feeling of anxiety for quite a long time, but not really recognised it as such. And then, like I say, one night I woke up, my heart was beating fast, my mouth was dry, my stomach was churning, I was urging, I felt really sick. I actually thought I was dying. And I thought I was dying, wasn't really sure what was happening. But I also was concerned because I'd been taking so many painkillers over a long period of time. All of the side effects of the painkillers are dry mouth palpitations. Those, And I actually thought that they'd had a huge impact on my health. And I was dying. Wow. So that really scared me. You and it was imagine. the middle of the night, pitch black. Things always happen at night, don't they? And it's, it always, it's always do. seems worse so at night. So true. Everything seems worse. Um, and I just basically sat in the bathroom on the floor in a heap, not knowing what to do, trying to catch my breath. Uh, and then the morning came. So I rang the doctor. Uh, and But really, I think it, it was just the straw that broke the camel's back. I was in an absolute mess by that time. I felt too sick to eat, couldn't really eat. My muscles just felt like they were absolutely frozen in tension. So I found it hard to even walk upright. And I just was sobbing. I was a sobbing mess. Thank you for sharing that so vulnerably and openly. And I know you're really passionate about talking about this experience, even though it is vulnerable to Mm. open up on these topics because you want to see any stigma or Mm. shame that we attach to the word breakdown Mm. removed for good. Yes. And... Your story is not just one of heartache, it's also one of immense hope, isn't Mm. it? Because although you found yourself quite literally on the floor, overwhelmed in that place of breakdown, over a period of time and through a long and intentional process, actually, you came to a place of full recovery. Can you tell us more about how you went from rock bottom to Mm. recovery and that journey? Yeah, well, at first I I felt very bewildered as to how I'd ended up there. Yeah, I can imagine. Very confused, very shameful, because when I was younger, anybody with a breakdown or mental health problems, it all been whispered about and such a shame for them. And and it it felt to me like it was something to be incredibly ashamed about. Mm, felt guilty because I felt like I was letting everybody down. So not only was I in this terrible place of pain, headaches, shame it was just the shame it heaped upon me and 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 I didn't want to tell anybody what had happened to me so it was quite isolating at first but thankfully a really good friend of mine said to me I think I know what's happened to you and at first I was like no 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 not me not no this capable career woman it could not be no it could not be me could possibly not have happened to me no so um but gradually I kind of thought I think she's right and she Mm. recommended a book to me And the book was really the start of the change. And it talked about how to get well. And I thought if she can, she's helped a lot of people, the author, to get well in her life. She was a doctor. I'll just follow her advice and I'll get well. So I started to really take it step by step. 
But a lot of things I started to think about of why had I ended up in this place. Mm. I started to realise that all the things I'd loved to do as a child, as a young person... I didn't do any more. I love to read. I'm a real bookworm. I love oh, to watch I love to read chick as flicks well. and things like that. And I hadn't done any of it because I'd become too busy, too mm. busy in my own importance, too busy not taking care of myself. And I never had a moment to myself, never had a bath or, or anything. So I started to input self-care into my life for the, probably the very first time, actually. And I also started looking into irritable bowel, how to get through it, how to cope with pain. I, I stopped taking the painkillers. I was too scared, actually, to take them. I went to see an osteopath to work on my back and my neck uh, and all sorts of different holistic approaches to actually make myself well. I started looking at nutrition to help the irritable bowel syndrome. And I found that when I ate better... Bearing in mind I hadn't learned to cook really because my mum had been ill a lot of my um, formative years, that it had an impact on my irritable bowel syndrome. So gradually, and it was gradually. Wow. And, and for me, it was even if I could not experience the panic running through my body for a minute, and that's all it was, even a minute would give me some relief from the panic running through my body. So even if in the bath, it would still be there, but it, I thought it's doing me good. And that belief of this is doing me good started to really build up and uh, I really started to believe in what I was doing and I think that mindset started to shift and obviously I still believe that I still believe in going out in the fresh air and walking I still believe but those early days even walking around the block with my muscles in the tension they were was so difficult with the panic running through my body but gradually and very little by little all of those things amalgamated to create healing for me. And I think there's so much beauty in that because a lot of what you are doing now is based around sustainable solutions for yeah. women and girls. And I'm sure that there were moments as a woman of faith that you prayed and asked God for healing. Yeah. Um, but I love the way that actually he gave you tools to be intentional and consistent in small things, investing in your mm. own worth, investing in your own well-being in a variety of different ways to actually find your way out of that. Yeah. I'm sure there must have been moments for you where it felt like you were never going to see Absolutely. the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Where was God in all of this then? I think you're right. I think seeing light at the end of the tunnel sometimes was really difficult. And actually, it felt like two steps forward and three back sometimes. Yes. Um, and it was a journey. And I had prayed for many years as a Christian that God would heal my, my back and my neck and the headaches. And it hadn't seemed to happen. And then when I was in the breakdown, I was in such a bad, bad state that I couldn't even pray, couldn't utter words to sentence, to create a sentence to pray. No. Um, and that was, again, heaped some guilt on me as a Christian that, well, when you're in a desperate situation, what you should be doing, what you should be doing right. is pray. But gradually I came to the perspective that God loves me and he wants the best for me. And he understands that right now I'm just not in that position where Absolutely. I can even do that. And he knows that and it's OK. And I gave my permission that it was OK. So gradually... Um, I, I did begin to pray more uh, and I think God for me was in it and throughout all that journey because he was teaching me something that would sustain me for the rest of my life and that has enabled me to do what I do now so much better than what I could have. I think if I'd have been healed instantaneously or it was a simpler journey for me, I wouldn't have learnt the life lessons that enable me to do everything well now. Incredible how he weaves everything mm. into this beautiful tapestry, all the broken bits, all the bits yeah. that we would rather conceal and hide away yeah. and pretend weren't there in our story. Yeah. And yet those are the very things he uses. Absolutely. Thinking about the work that you do now, if I was going to take the next logical step in your journey to this point where we are now in your story, mm. I would think, oh, I'm sure that you waited until you were well and truly out of the other side and into your recovery before stepping into becoming director of World of Worth. But actually, one of the things I find fascinating and hugely encouraging about your journey is that actually you took that step somewhere in the messy middle of recovery. Recovery. And uh, I know that it was, you know, a good few months into that mm. process of recovery. 
But I think there's something so encouraging about that, that you didn't wait until you quote unquote had it all together or were in this place of feeling stronger, but that actually in the middle of the the mess, in the middle of the brokenness, in the middle of the recovery process, you stepped into the next part of your purpose. Tell me more about that. I think I felt I didn't have a choice to step into it right at that moment. I would have liked to have waited until perhaps I had it all together. Although I did learn throughout the breakdown that we never have it all together and that's okay. So, um, and... And I think that's a really important lesson to have learned to not even pretend to have it all together, to learn to laugh at yourself and, and good just advice be, to be real. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I actually had already been interviewed for the position, already m- been given the position, and it was due to happen in the April. And I had the breakdown in the November. So it was quite a short period away. And I was working out, well, I was due to be working out my notice at work, but had to take time off sick actually because of the breakdown. Yeah. So I would have preferred to have waited. And in fact, I actually had huge self-doubts when I was in that breakdown about my ability to even do the role because Mm. it was a huge role. There was so many people depending on me to do the role well. So that whole sense of responsibility again. Yeah. And I I just really felt that I wasn't qualified to do it anymore. I just felt I was too broken. And I really, as a Christian, I actually felt, well, how can God do anything with me in this broken state that I'm I'm in? I also pretended to people such as the trustees of the charity and and Andy's parents who started the charity World of Worth that I was actually okay. (laughs) I'm sure they knew I wasn't. But I was really trying hard because I thought if they knew Mm. how bad I was and uh, the state I was in, they wouldn't let me do it. And it was something I had absolutely passionately wanted to do for a very Mm. long time. And so I pretended that I was okay in order to get the job. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But that meant taking it on in the midst of my recovery. Yeah. And when I started, I just remember thinking if they knew how I felt inside, I wouldn't be sitting here now. Uh, and it wasn't until a bit later in that month that I went to see a friend, beautiful uh, lady friend of mine, older lady. And I just said to her, I just don't know how God can, can use me now. And she said, don't be silly. Of course, God can use you now. And at that moment, I actually felt some words drop into my head, which I believe was God just saying to me, I can use you better now in your brokenness. Wow. I can use you better. That is beautiful. And I love that because one of the things I connect with most about you is how real you are, how vulnerable you are. I intersect with your brokenness, but I also take huge hope and encouragement from what we're about to come to in your story. I know that for many women today listening to you, They're going to take a lot of strength from hearing your story. Thank you for being so open and so vulnerable with us. But I know that stepping into leading World of Worth was life changing for you. You had been involved with and passionate about the charity for many years. What grabbed your heart about the work that World of Worth do? And was there a defining moment for you where you actually thought, do you know what? Despite my brokenness, I am in my sweet spot doing what I was designed to do. Yeah, I think I've always obviously been passionate about helping other people. And it wasn't initially focused on women and girls. Uh, the charity uh, sponsored children around the world. And so very shortly into doing the charity, so maybe about a year after my recovery, I was due to go to India. And for some reason... I hadn't even thought about foreign travel and traveling abroad. <laughs> no I'm way! Just like, I'm doing a travel that charity in Africa and India, and you <laughs> hadn't even thought about this fact. Well, oh, Rachel. <laughs> but uh, so uh, I had to make a plan very quickly of how I was going to cope with this. Being yeah. in, still in the early age, uh, stages of recovery. That's daunting, isn't it? It is daunting. So I went to Boots and bought up most of the medical supplies I could possibly <laughs> get my hands on. But my whole focus really actually was meeting a child that Andy and I had sponsored 
since we were quite young. Oh, what a privilege to go and meet a yes. sponsor child in India. Uh, but when I got there, we'd actually sent some money ahead as the new directors of the charity for Christmas. And it wasn't something that had been done before. And we'd sent some money ahead for 35 women who were widows in India to, to have a sari. And I hadn't even thought about visiting them. But part of the two weeks that I was there was visiting this small project. And that was the defining moment because I entered this room and there was these joyful women all suddenly surged on me, kissing me, cuddling oh, me, wow. hugging me, twirling around in these vibrant saris. And I was, I said to the, the project leader, what are they doing? Like all swirling around dancing. She said, they're showing off their dress. Nobody has bought them a new outfit ever before. They barely have anything, let alone new clothes. And she said they are absolutely delighted with their new outfit. And I just felt really overwhelmed by the mm. joy, the gratitude. They were five pounds each, these saris. And the gratitude, you'd have thought I'd have handed them a thousand pounds. And Goodness. so I said to them, when I, when I came out of the room, I said, I want to see where these women and how these women live. I want to know more about their stories. Bearing in mind, they weren't elderly, elderly widows. Some of them were probably my age, young children. When I went to see how they lived, it absolutely broke my heart. And that was the start of the, abs the absolute passion I felt to change their life. Because I had, f from my experience, even though things went wrong, I was privileged. I had an education. Yes. I had a career. I had mm -hmm. opportunity to earn money and to, to be an independent woman. And I just felt that they had nothing. They, they weren't educated. They had no opportunity. People bypass them because they were widows and in rural areas in India you're seen as cursed because your husband's died before you wow so you are really ostracized out of society and knowing all this and seeing them in their little small one-roomed huts with no running water barely any food trying to send their children to school but not been able to afford it so their children were exploited or having to work it was just so shocking and out of my sphere mm. of normality in this country to see that happening, that it broke my heart and did something to me that I was determined to change. So that was an absolute pivot point yes. for you, wasn't it? Yeah. And that feeling of your heart being undone for the things that are on God's heart. Yes. I know that your work is with women and girls yeah. predominantly. Why is that? I think... Over a period of years, we focused in on women and girls because my perspective has been altered and just seen how much women and girls are marginalised, mm. how they are the ones that suffer predominantly domestic violence, hunger, human trafficking. They are always in the higher statistics of people that are suffering. I've just found that they are the ones that are ostracised from society, the most marginalised Absolutely. And here at Bespoke Conversations, that is one of the things that we are passionate about changing the story for. Uh, and I know that you at World of Worth are actively changing the story for hundreds of mm. women and girls. So can you tell us a little bit more about your projects and the difference that they're making to the futures and the outcomes of women and girls across different nations? So we work in predominantly in Africa, countries in Africa and India, and we really place emphasis on educating girls, getting them through university. And to be honest, a girl from that background would never, ever have the chance to go to university. So mm -hmm. seeing girls go through university, getting a degree is incredible. We love seeing their stories change and that happening yes, for them. Yes, come on. Uh, also, uh, for women, we actually train them in business so that they get the opportunity to run their own micro businesses. We give them micro loans so that they can borrow, repay, reborrow, grow their businesses. Uh, we train them in agriculture. We have land where they can receive training. We train them in something called perma gardening, which gives them opportunity to grow food and sell oh, and fantastic. raise money so they can have that by the side of their house. So our whole aim is to help women to help themselves to get out of poverty because poverty has so many connotations to it. The mm. fear, disease, everything about it. Um, it just has such an impact on their life. But to get them out of poverty, actually themselves getting out of poverty for me is the pivotal change that we can bring and that changes generations it doesn't just it change does. it for the girl that's been educated it changes it for her children Chil children who are born to an educated woman are less likely to die before the age of five so that it has all these 
amazing ripple effects out for the woman's future generation. It sounds absolutely incredible and I'm struck by the parallels with your own journey. This thread of sustainability, of Mm. sustainable solutions about giving women tools Mm. to enable them to break free from that cycle of poverty that they find themselves in, which somehow to me seems to mirror the way in which your recovery came Mm. about, which was also just strategies and tools to enable you to live in a different way and in a more sustainable way. Um, I love that mirror image and and the way that nothing is wasted in our own experience. Um, But I'd love to know what some of the standout moments have been to date for you. What stands out, good or bad? When you do do work like this, there are really low moments and really high moments. Mm. It's like a roller coaster, actually. There The things you see really impact you. They're hard to see sometimes. It's highs and lows. Um, I think one of the lows but became a high was the journey of a young girl. And she was brought to our children's home in India when she was seven years old. Mm -hmm. And we get a lot of children, girls, young girls brought to our homes for safety purposes because they're not safe in the villages from assault and other trafficking and lots of other horrendous experiences so they're often brought to our homes to keep them safe Mm -hmm. and one of the young girls was brought and she was in an absolutely terrible state and Andy my husband happened to be there at the time she came into the home and her head was shaved she actually went under the table and she rocked and she wouldn't come out and that's unusual because when you have sweets we take sweets with us and you're always really popular when you have sweets for children (laughs) I can imagine Uh, yeah and um she wouldn't come out she wouldn't speak and the uh social worker who brought her said she will never ever recover from the trauma that she has experienced we, we don't see a future for her oh, that's really heartbreaking she's just going to be affected by this trauma for the rest of her life um so my husband said what's happened to her and her mother was assaulted and got pregnant uh with this girl she then struggled really badly with her mental health the mother mm. so when the daughter was seven years old she got on a train and said we're going on a journey and as the train was pulling into well it's actually pulling into a platform but still going very fast she asked the girl to hug her and hold on tight and she jumped from the train no and she her mother died right there on the side of the tracks the girl was injured she broke her collarbone um and cut all herself um obviously absolutely traumatized was found by the guard who took her back to her hometown, to her grandmother's house. But her grandmother had abused the mother and started abusing the little girl. Oh, no. So she was then um, brought to our children's home for her own safety. And that was where she was at, under the table, traumatised. So it makes me want to cry just telling the story. It's hugely emotional. And then um through the love and care of the children's home which we try really hard not to make like an institution Mm. we try to make it a family environment the wardens there are like house parents they love the girls um just year on year we saw her growing and changing and in the end her sponsor dropped out and I was like she can't not have a sponsor so Andy and I took her as our sponsor child and we had the privilege to keep going to India and meeting her Mm. and explaining you know that we were her sponsor parents now and we loved her and cared about her and what's been amazing is she went to university she graduated as a social worker And at the point she graduated, we needed a social worker to work in our children's homes. And so we employed her to work in our children's home as a social worker. That's incredible. And not last year, but the year before, Andy and I were invited to her wedding. Oh. (laughs) So I got to go to this amazing Indian wedding, dress up in a sari and see our sponsor child get married. How beautiful. Low to high. Ashes. Beauty. Yes brokenness wholeness wholeness and restoration yeah. and I'm sure that that's an ongoing journey in yeah. her life but what an incredible yeah. opportunity yeah. to come alongside yeah. and through love through practical action mm. through all that you're doing as a charity to be able to um, give that beautiful girl hope a future mm. an opportunity 
just incredible. And sadly, really sadly, her story is not unique. No. And so we hear so much trauma from these girls, but they are survivors. And through love and care and God's love and care for them, they, they come out different. You have seen so much injustice and inequality. And I'm sure it's going to be hard to answer this question because of everything that you have been exposed to. But what would you say are the greatest challenges when it comes to injustice that you would like to see change for women and girls? That is a massive, massive question. It really is. For me, I think it comes down to women and girls do not have opportunity. Mm. And that not having an opportunity leads to all the other injustices. It makes them vulnerable. It makes them vulnerable to trafficking. It makes them vulnerable to exploitation. Uh, The lack of education, I think, is a very big one for me. I think when you start to educate a woman, not only in academically, but also in life skills and other things that we teach them about anti-trafficking, we teach them about self-worth. That's why we're called World of Worth. We want to create a world in which they know their value and worth. I love that. So it's, it's that whole holistic approach to educating them in every single way and showing them that they're loved and they're precious to us, to the uh, house parents, to the project leaders and in God's eyes as well. And so it's, it is about changing their mindset. So I, I can't really give you a definitive answer to that because no, it's such a massive it's question. Huge. But to me, education is the big way forward. I am totally with you on that. And I know we've had several conversations. Um, I'm really hoping that Bespoke as we move forward is going to play a part somehow in changing outcomes for women and girls in the area of education. Mm. It's so, so needed and something that it's easy for us to take for granted here in the UK. Now, we've alluded to your faith and I know that that has motivated so much of what you do and what you will continue to do but looking at the strands of your story (laughs) from your childhood years and your experiences there through to your breakdown and recovery and then thinking about this um, incredible stretch of working with women who are marginalized um, and who are living in poverty but enabling them to break free where do you see God in the midst of all of that desolation and and difficulty I think in my own journey there were times where I did wonder where God was and and why he wasn't answering my prayers Mm. and I think when you often come through things and then you look back, you can see perhaps, not always, but why God led you through that way. And I can certainly see why God led me through that way to learn the strategies, the self-care, to take care of myself, to have the energy to do everything that I do today. And also to be able to often help other people through your journey. I think for me, it's, it is a story of hope that you can recover fully and that you can be well. And I want to actually give that hope to other people who might be struggling. Uh, so where did I see God? I think there's a song that I love and it's, um, the goodness of God. Great song. And it talks about how God is with us in the darkest times, Mm. even if we can't feel him, even if we we don't necessarily know that, but that God is always with us in the darkest of times. And also that goodness and mercy follows us. And sometimes people say to me, "How, how can you see God's goodness in those circumstances? And that's a really difficult question to answer when you Mm. see the things that I've seen. But all I can say is that there is hope and we can all do a a small part and change the narrative for somebody. I know that there will be some women listening in today who feel that all they can see in front of them right now are the ashes and perhaps they can't see anything Mm. beautiful in their story. Mm. What would you say to them? I would say that life is full of seasons and Mm -hmm. sometimes they're not as quick as the seasons that we go through, you know, spring, autumn. If only it was that quick and our problems disappeared that quickly. Sometimes things take a long, long time that you're in the darkness for, but there is hope and it does come to an end. And I am living proof of that in terms of so many times of my life, I've seen that things come to an end and you you move forward and you move on and you recover. And it does sound glib and cliche to say that, but I can honestly say my the dark time took me a long time to climb out of. 
and it never seemed like I was going to get there. But I can genuinely give hope that there is hope that comes out of the brokenness and the darkness and you will find your way out. Beautiful. And there, there'll be other women listening in today who perhaps find themselves on the other side and there might be a passion stirring in them as they listen to you describing the sense of purpose that you have found with World of Worth and your work there. For those women who are listening thinking, I'm ready. I want to make a difference. I want to change the story, even if it's just for one person. And it it might be in an area that we've touched on today, but it actually might be something that's more in line with their own story and experience in life. What encouragement could you give those women today? I think that when you're living in your passion, Mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily need to be your full time passion, but when you're doing something that you're passionate about, you feel alive, you feel fulfilled. Uh, and there's no better place to to be than feeling alive and fulfilled and that you are have a purpose mm-hmm. so it doesn't matter what your passion is and never ever compare yourself to somebody else that's great advice because actually sometimes you can look at people and think oh, they do something so amazing I could never be like that mm-hmm. and I never want anybody to ever look at me like that because behind the scenes I think you know we have talked about the swan with the duck legs you know trying to (laughs) trying to sort of get everything done and the the funny things that happen around that and and life is real so I I would encourage anybody whatever your passion is just to go for it and enjoy it and and live it because it's it's just so great to find your passion and and like I say don't compare it. it it's yours and it's you and it's unique to you and you can't be passionate about something that isn't special to you and isn't about you so it could be anything but just find it and enjoy it that is brilliant advice we're coming into land now and I have two questions that I love to ask all my guests on bespoke conversations don't have to be long answers are you ready for this Rachel go on then first which woman has inspired you most whether that's historic or present day there are many But I think for me, because of my work in India with women and girls and in poverty, it had to be Mother Teresa. Oh, absolutely. What a woman. So inspiring. I love the fact that she gave up so much just to sit, often just sit with those who are dying and broken. Yeah. I mean, the embodiment of faith in action, really. Yeah. Yeah. And in no more than five words, if you could leave us today with a motivational quote to live by, what would it be? Okay, Uh, again, many quotes. I think one of the ones that resonates with me is more than five words, but I'll leave you with three at the end. Great. Is be the change you want to see in the world. Great. Whether that is with yourself So changing yourself to uh, become healthy, to do self-care, because I want to really promote that and, and, and just say that you are worth it. Yes. To take care of yourself is so important. Yes. And so be the change that you want to see in yourself. Only you can do that uh, with, with support and help and, but it comes from you, but also changing the narrative for someone else. If you're passionate about something, if you're, if you feel angry about injustice, just make small changes. And uh, I shared with you, I think earlier about my brother who is passionate about the environment and he takes a litter picker on holiday. No way! And he picks up um, litter off the beach when he's on holiday abroad. That is brilliant. And now I can't go for a dog walk without picking up a dirty can or something off the side of the path That's and putting so it in the bin because he's influenced mm. me. And when you're passionate about changing the world... It's just the little things. Do the little things. We have a saying at WOW, we can't change the world, but we can change someone's world. So my under five words after all that (laughs) are be the change. Love it. Be the change. Rachel David, thank you. Thank you. You've been watching episode four of Bespoke Conversations. Thanks again to the amazing Rachel David. It's been great to chat to you. If you want to find out more or support the work that Rachel and World of Worth are doing, you can head to their website, wowuk.org. Big thank you to you today for joining me. Head over to bespokeconversations.co.uk to catch all our previous episodes. And if you want to get in touch with us, please email us at info at I'll see you next time.